Hello everybody, in this video lecture we will cover chapter 11, part 2, Evidence for Evolution. So evidence for evolution comes from many different areas of biology. And we will discuss some of this evidence. But before we begin, um, I want to just make sure what exactly, what claim exactly we want to support. Evolution tell us, well, if you put it very, very simple, that evolution tell us pretty, pretty much two things. And the first thing is that life on our planet is changing over time, right? And uh, life is changing means life is evolving. That's the one claim that the theory of evolution tell us. And another important thing is that we all are related through our shared ancestry. So that's what we want. When we look at this evidence, ask yourself, is this kind of support the fact that life is changing and that we are related? And what does it mean we are related and how we can support this statement? Well, we want to find evidence of our similarities because if we can prove that we are very similar all living organisms on, on uh, earth are very similar to each other so if we can support this statement that we are similar then we can make the assumption right um, or conclusion from this uh, observation that we are related and it's not that hard really imagine if you're walking in the mall and you see let's say two girls coming towards you and they look very similar what would be your assumption your assumption would be they must be related maybe they are sisters well if they really look very similar you can even say maybe they are twins they're not that similar maybe they're sister or maybe they're cousins Right, so similarity tell us about some uh, common ancestry, right? Uh, that, that's what I'm trying to tell you. So I'm trying to tell you that if we find evidence of change and evidence of similarity, this is what we can use to support the theory of evolution, right? So let's look at anatomy. Looking at anatomy of different species, we can see that different plants, different animals, right? We can share similar physical features. And why would we share similar features? Well, possibly because that particular feature was present in the common ancestor. We call it homologous structure, right? And you can say like, well, there is no similarities between me and my little puppy. But, you know, students in colleges who study human anatomy, they do dissection. And they very often dissect a cat, a rabbit, uh, maybe a mink. So why would you dissect a cat and study cat anatomy if you are in human anatomy class? Well, because there are many similarities. Internal organs, blood vessels, uh, nerves, muscles. There's so many similar features between human and other animals that we even study human anatomy. Well, at the beginning, right? To dissecting cat and mink and uh, rabbit. Right? That tell us that this physical feature that we share was probably present in our common ancestry. Molecular biology. What molecular biology tell us if we look at structure of DNA, if we look at genetic code, and I'm reminding you the genetic code is how uh, information in DNA is transcribed and then translated into protein. So this Two molecules, DNA and, and uh, genetic code, sorry, is not a molecule, and genetic code, it's very similar in all living organisms. And that's also show us 
common ancestry. Right, so anatomy, molecular biology show us similarities between living organisms. Another evidence that we can use it comes from biogeography. And biogeography show us the global distribution of organism and at the same time unique feature of island species. And this reflects evolution and geological change. Fossils. Fossils document the existence of non-exist past species that are related to present day species. So fossils pretty much tell us that life is changing. Those ancient plants and animals that we find in the fossil records, they're not exactly the same as modern species, but the modern species do resemble them, and that tell us two things, change and similarities. And remember, in all this evidence, we're looking for evidence of change and for evidence of similarity. And as a result of similarity, Oh, no, I'm sorry. As a result of common ancestry, we have these similarities. Direct observation. Uh, we can directly observe small-scale evolution in organisms with short life cycles, such as bacteria, pesticide-resistant insects. So we will look at this in more details. So fossils. Fossils provide solid evidence that organisms from the past are not the same as those found today. Fossils show also progression of evolution. So highly detailed fossil records have been recovered for sequences of species in the evolution of whales and modern horses. And we also have what is called transitional fossils those that show intermediate anatomy between earlier and later forms. So here's the fossil records of the horse evolution, and we can go back uh, to 55, 45 million years ago when the first fossils was found, and you can see this gradual progression of change within um, horse species. Um, another well-studied um, fossil records are found in evolution of the dolphins. So you can see um, Ambulocetus, so that's this animal over here. And um, we believe it's lived about 50 million years ago. The first fossils were discovered in Pakistan in 1992. And this is reconstruction of how this animal would look like based on the fossil records. Uh, now, Duradon, um, that's the animal that lived about 30 and 40 million years ago, and fossils have been found in North America, Egypt, as well as Pakistan, and this is reconstruction. So you see how the body, over here, how the body is changing, and um, the um, modern dolphins that do not have legs, right? We can trace their evolution back to the quadrupod animal. And then we see reduction in uh, front and back limbs over here. Um, so if you ask me, well, do we have enough fossils? Uh, would we like to have more? Yeah, we don't have enough fossils probably, and we would love to have fossils that would explain us every single change that we can see in the living organism today. But we don't. But that's not the most important thing about fossils. The most important thing about fossils is that fossils show us the progression of evolution. Fossils in older layers are more primitive than those in the upper layers. So if you look at the fossils of animals without backbones, right, they predate vertebrates. Amphibians appears after fish. Mammals appears after reptiles. 
and no complex life occurs in rock nearly as old as those containing the oldest fossil of bacteria. Um, and extinct fossils resemble modern animals. That's what we call transitional species. These show common ancestry. So if we look at this um, diagram here, and we relate this information to our fossil records. So if we have, let's say, if we have fossil that we can date 564 million years old, in the fossil that old, we should not find any mammals uh, or any birds or, let's say, any plants that have flowers, because at that time, this organism did not exist, right? So if we take, if we go up and let's say we find fossil dating this time, right? About 360, 284 million years ago, right? Again, we know that that's when we have uh, appearance of amphibians, right? And gymnosperm. So again, in these fossils, we should not see any remains of human, for example, because they just did not exist at that time. So did we find enough fossils? Maybe not. But did we find fossils that contradict our hypothesis about this type of events? No, we didn't find any fossils that would contradict the theory of evolution. So fossils are in the sequence and that's what important. Um, anatomy and embryology. Remember, we mentioned that uh, evidence for evolution comes from different branches of biology and other um, science, right? So homology comes from anatomy. So homology is the similarity in structures due to common ancestry and illustrated by re remodeling of pattern of bones, forming the four limbs of mammals of, for different functions. So you can see here on the right. So evolution led to changes in the shape and sizes of these bones in different species, but they have maintained the same overall layout evidence of descent from a common ancestor. So if our hypothesis is that human dogs, birds, and whale. They all share the common ancestor. Maybe the small mammal, right, that had uh, four legs, right, maybe some fur, uh, warm-blooded. So if you're looking at this common ancestor, some here, you know, deep in time, and we look at the um, pattern of the four limbs, what we expect to see. We expect to see actually the same layout, the same bones. So we have like one bone right here, one bone, one bone. Then we have two bones. Then we have small bones and then we have phalanges. And um, that tell us that this structure was modified to serve specific function, but it was not created over over from the scratch. Because evolution is a remodeling process. It's not building something new every single time. And that evidence shows us that, that this is a remodeling of, of, of these structures. Vestigial structure. Vestigial structure are remnants of features that serve important function in an organism ancestor and now have only marginal, if any, importance. And um, there is also lots of, you know, um, talk about the vestigial structure. Um, some of them we used to call them vestigial and we don't do it anymore, but it's normal. Science is never written in a stone. It's, it's a process and we get new information, we get new data, new evidence, and we're changing um, 
our perception, right? We cannot be arrogant. So, for example, we used to think that appendix was a vestigial structure, and now many scientists agree that it is not. But we still have some part of the body in animals. That the best way to explain why they even exist is that they they were present in the ancestors, right? And then they just lost their importance. Let's say this is a whale, and you can see this bone, the part of the pelvic bones. And pelvis is a structure that attach your uh, legs to your torso, right? Because whales, they don't have any legs. Why would they have this? pelvic bones still present. So the explanation would be that whales um, are, uh, the whales evolved from the terrestrial organisms that used to have their legs. Another example is the wisdom teeth that now has no important function in humans because our jaws became smaller. Uh, now, on this diagram, you can see human embryo, and we know that human embryo receive its um, uh, food supply and oxygen supply through the placenta, but at the early stages of development, we still have a yolk sac that is present, let's say, in a chicken. Right? And not only we have a yolk sac, we have a genes for making yolk proteins, and those genes are highly mutated, so we don't make yolk anymore. So why would we have genes for yolk production if we don't synthesize yolk? The, uh, humans also have genes for making vitamin C, and these genes are also have mutations. That's why we cannot synthesize vitamin C anymore, right? So Again, the question is, why would we have genes for something that we're not making? Uh, maybe the answer would be because our ancestors had this gene, and this gene worked in their bodies, and over time, it just mutation happened, and we lost this ability to make protein C, to make yolk proteins. Um, this is actually diagrams that show us um, how mammals lost ability to synthesize vitamin C. And if we find us over here, so we write here Homo sapiens, and this is our close um, relatives over here. So if you go back, so scientists um, figure out that at this point of time, mutation happened in this gene for vitamin C synthesis. So all the uh, animals that evolved from this point, they lost this ability, right? And uh, when they compared the mutation, it's actually the same mutation in Homo sapiens, in the gorilla, right? And, you know, all these animals. But this ones, um, they still synthesize vitamin C. Not only that, um, scientists found that, let's say, bats or guinea pigs over here, they also have mutation in their um, gene for uh, vitamin C synthesis. But those are completely different mutations. It's not the same mutation that uh, present in this organism over here. Okay, um, comparative embryology. When we... Um, Compare early stages of development in different animal species, we can see additional homologous relationship. For example, pharyngeal pouch appears on the side of the embryo throat, which develops into gill structure in fish and develops in the part of the ear and throat in humans. Comparative embryology of vertebrates supports evolutionary theory. So over here, you can see the um, embryo of the dolphin, 24 days old. And here, a human embryo, 30 days old. And when we compare different 
structure, right, like this um, part over here and this, this is what's supposed to develop into arm, right? So, and human embryo will develop arm, but dolphin will never develop a new arm over here. Right, so similarities um, through the embryonic development are also very interesting. So here's a human fetus, 28 weeks old, with this fine hair covering his body that's called lanuga hair. And then it just disappeared before the birth. So the question remains, why would human fetus be covered with hair if we are born without hair in our body, without this lanuga hair. Um, oh, here's another interesting uh, example um, that can support the theory of evolution and specifically, specifically common ancestry. Number of chromosomes. Number of chromosomes in the great apes you can see gorilla, chimpanzee, orangutan, they all have 48 chromosomes, and human, they, we have 46. So um, if we came from same ancestry, right? So that's the animal here back in time. The question is, how many chromosomes would that animal um, had? Was it 48? Was it 46? And if it was 48, what happens with two chromosomes? So um, scientists, um, scientists propose this explanation. So they said, what if two chromosomes of, the, of our ancestor, right? What if they fused together? And if two chromosomes, like you see over here and over here, if they fused together, then this is how we have this reduction of two chromosomes. Um, so can it be um, can it be proved? Can it be supported by observations or some experiment? So let's look at structure of a chromosome. Chromosomes have a special regions on their ends, and it's called telomere, and then special region somewhere in the middle that's called centromere. So every human chromosome and every chromosome of gorilla, chimpanzee, orangutan, every single chromosome would have two telomeres and one centromere, right? Now, if our hypothesis is right, and if we have two chromosomes fused together, then we need to find a chromosome in a human genome that has one, two, telomeres and one telomere somewhere in the middle, and it must have two centromere. Do we have chromosome like this? Yes, we do. And this is chromosome number two in the human genome. It's the second largest human chromosome. It has about 242 million base pair, and it carry 8% of the total human DNA. And um, we believe today that that's two chromosomes of our ancestor fused together, giving us this very unique, very interesting chromosome too. But this is how theory of evolution explain these differences in chromosome number. Right? Because science cannot you know, without theory of evolution, this is what I want to mention very, very briefly, because it's not my job to, you know, tell you, um, you know, you need to now go ahead and support theory of evolution. My job is just to present you with the material. But think about theory of evolution this way. Without theory of evolution, if, you know, if we have this question, why would human has 46 and gorilla, chimpanzee, and orangutan has 48? Without theory of evolution, the answer would be very easy because we were created this way. Because we were created with 46 chromosomes and gorilla, chimpanzee, and orangutan was created with 48 chromosomes. The end of the story. Then we wouldn't need to do any research. So we would never discover our chromosome number two. So theory of evolution keep us going. 
theory of evolution doesn't allow us to give simple answers to a very, very complicated questions. Okay, so molecular biology is a huge support in a theory of evolution. Structure of DNA was discovered. Universal code was discovered. Genes from one organism can replicate and function in another. DNA hybridization studies have found that the DNA of humans and chimpanzees are 98-99% identical. So over here, we can see on this diagram, we can see the a percent of uh, selected DNA sequences that match a chimpanzee's DNA. And you can see in a human and chimpanzee, we have huge similarities, right? Over here, about 90, 98%. And then with the gorilla, orangutan, gibbon, uh, old world monkeys, there is still just amazing similarities in the DNA structure. And um, this is how it's done. You know the DNA is nucleic acid and it's made of nucleotides. So here's a mouse gene, PAX6, and because that's a gene, that's a part of DNA, so it has this nucleotide, G, T, A, T, C, C, and so on, right? And then they um, take the same gene uh, in a fly, in a shark, in a squid, in a flatworm, and they compare them with this gene of the mouse. And what this gene does, it's responsible for uh, eye, eye control, right? So it's eye control gene. Um, fly eyeless gene even here was taken for comparison. And then they see like, okay, most of these sequences are the same. And then let's say over here, we have G, right? In the shark eye control gene, and in the fly, we have A. So that's pretty much what? It's a point mutation. Just at some point, this nucleotide, right? Was substituted with another one. And so you can see how many differences and similarities. So you can see that genetic similarities to mouse is 76.6, 85, 78, 72% almost. And you can see the protein similarities is 100%. Right? So these similarities in DNA tell us we are not that different. Right? Fly and shark and squid and flatworm and mouse. Even they look very different, but what does it mean very different? You look at their uh, gene structure, not that different anymore. Biogeography. Remember we mentioned that biogeography is also evidence for evolution. So geographic distribution of organisms on the planet follow patterns that are best explained by evolution in conjunction with the movement of tectonic plates over geological time. So the scientists pretty much wonder why some species are found pretty much everywhere. And some are very specific to you know, some continent or to some area. Right? That's, that's why this biogeography is that important. So broad groups that evolved before the break of the supercontinent Pangaea about 200 million years ago are distributed worldwide. Uh, worldwide. So um, if we're talking about species that evolved when our um, when we had this one huge supercontinent Pangaea, right, then it's pretty much had this ability to move to all this area. And when continents spread apart, we see this pretty much distribution through the whole world. But the group that evolved since they break up appears uniquely in regions of the planet. Right? So that's how biogeography explain why some species found almost on every continent and some are just unique to a specific part of the land.
direct observation. So in the 1950s, there was a worldwide effort to eradicate malaria by eliminating its carrier, certain type of mosquitoes. So uh, malaria is a disease, right? And it's pretty mm, devastating, very serious disease. Even today, about 1 million people uh, worldwide die from malaria. Today, when we have a medication. Right, so how to prevent so many malaria deaths? Well, how about we just try to kill all the mosquitoes that carry this malaria parasite? How we can kill mosquitoes? We can use special pesticides, DDT. So DDT was sprayed broadly in area where the mosquitoes lived. So we kill mosquitoes, we kill the carrier, so we prevent people from getting sick by malaria. So at first, DDT was highly effective at killing the mosquitoes. However, over time, the DDT became less and less effective and more and more mosquitoes survived. This was because the mosquito population evolved resistant to the pesticide. So in a short period of time, we were able to see how population of mosquito, mosquitoes changed and they became um, resistant to pesticides. And remember, change in the population, we call it evolution. We do call it microevolution, um, but that's, that's the whole point, that population can change. But let's see what, what happened, really. So this is our original population even before pesticide was used. And some, some mosquitoes, by random chance, by random chance, shown here in red, had a genetic mutation that made them resistant to pesticides. These mosquitoes never wanted this mutation. They didn't have this meeting, mosquitoes meeting, and like, Okay, let's vote. We want to have this mutation just in case the pesticide is applied. So mosquitoes never wanted to have it. It was just random luck. Maybe this mosquito over here has some other mutation. Maybe it makes it resistant to, uh, I don't know, sunlight. We don't know that, right? Because we need to apply this pesticide. And pesticide is called selective pressure. So now if we apply this selective pressure, if we apply this pesticides, what is it going to do? It's going to kill most of the mosquitoes, but those that are resistant, and they are resistant because of random mutations, they survive. And if they survive, they leave more offspring. So population over population over population, when we kill everyone who is not resistant, we end up with a population that has higher percentage of individual resistant to pesticides. The pesticide, right? And this is how evolution works. We don't get what we want. Just some individuals are lucky enough to have it. And if, and if environment changes, and if selective pressure is present, those lucky individuals with a mutation that allows them to survive, this change in the environment. If they survive, they reproduce, they increase their genes in the next populations. And that's how we have pesticide resistant uh, mosquitoes and pests. And the similar happened with bacteria, right? When we apply all this cleaning supply, let's say if you buy Lysol, and it tells you it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. But the question is, okay, then what happened with this 0.1%? We don't kill them, so they will reproduce. That means we will see more and more resistant bacteria in next generations. Okay, so here, emergence of DDT, Emergence of DDT resistance is an example of evolution by natural selection. Before DDT was applied, a tiny fraction of mosquitoes in the population would have 
had naturally occurring gene versions or alleles that made them resistant to DDT. When DDT spraying began, most of the mosquitoes would have been killed by the pesticides. Which mosquito would have survived? For the most part, only the rare individuals that happen to have resistance allele. Over generation, more and more DDT-resistant mosquitoes would have been born into the population. Okay, so that was our last slide. And um, we, we covered some evidence for evolution and hope it was helpful.